Welcome to the June edition of our monthly in-service for the Kent unit of the Northwest Kidney Center, the best dialysis facility in the civilized world. While I miss giving in-services in person, I have to say I'm getting quite comfortable with the online format. Um, emphasis on the comfortable as I sit here in my pajamas with no obligation to go anywhere in this time of quarantine except back and forth to the refrigerator. I haven't bathed in who knows how many weeks and I smell something awful, which reminds me of the subject of today's in-service, which is the sewer system and associated drain problems and their impact on dialysis facilities. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to extend a hearty thanks to my mother and the four other people who liked last month's video. That's up from two likes the months before, which represents a 150% increase and excellent progress. As you can see, the title of this month's in-service is Drain Pain, which was inspired by the problems that we have had with our sewer drain here in Kent. We never really think about the sewer system until it backs up. And since this happened to our beloved dialysis unit within the past six weeks, I thought now would be a good time to have an in-depth discussion of the municipal sewer system. Uh, special thanks to Joe, our FSS, as well as Deborah Marcella, and all of you who helped out in the midst of this time of crisis. In the first part of this talk, we'll review the history of the sewer system. Then we'll launch into an academic discussion of the Kent drain problem, uh, fo focusing on the role of nanoparticles and astrophysics in deriving a long-term environmentally suitable solution to the problem. We'll discuss other municipal drain problems with special emphasis on something called fatbergs. Finally, we'll review physiologic drain problems in the dialysis world. Let's begin with a discussion of the history of the sewer system. It's more interesting than it sounds. One of the first sewer systems ever built in all of human history was constructed by the Mesolithic and Neolithic tribes of the Orkney Islands. Uh, the Orkney Islands are an archipelago in the northern isle of Scotland. Uh, archaeology has revealed the first lavatory-like plumbing systems that were fitted into the recesses in the walls of homes with drainage outlets. Um, and certain liquid waste drained to areas either under or outside buildings as home, which is pretty amazing accomplishment for 5,000 years ago. Uh, around the same time in the Middle East, the Eshnunna, Babylonian, and Mesopotamian empires developed stormwater drain systems in the street. Um, drains were constructed of sun-baked bricks of cut stone or cut stone. <clears throat> uh, some homes were connected uh, to the sewers. Uh, in Babylon, uh, in some of the larger homes, people squatted over an opening in the floor of a small interior room. Uh, and then the waste fell through the opening into a perforated uh, cesspool located under the house. Um, <clears throat> Babylonia is also thought to be one of the first places that ever had molded clay, um, uh, that molded clay into pipe using a potter's wheel. So they made T's and angle joints, and then they baked them into drainage pipe as early as 4000 BC. Um, also at this time, the Minoan civilization um, located on the isle, uh, island of Crete, had one of the most uh, advanced plumbing and drainage systems in the world at that time. Um, the Minoans were <clears throat> the first advanced civilization uh, in Europe. They built uh, massive <clears throat> uh, building complexes, used sophisticated tools, uh, had stunning artwork, uh, produced literature, uh, and had a massive network of trade. Uh, and until Roman times, Minoan plumbing and drainage uh, were the most developed in what was then the Western world. Uh, many of the drains uh, built in 2000 BC are still in service today on Crete. Um, drainage systems were made of terracotta pipe uh, and the open top drainage systems were built of stone as you can see in the photo to the right. Um, they mostly conveyed stormwater, but also human waste, and some of the sewers were large enough for people to walk through. 
Um, <clears throat> latrines were flushed with water from large jars, although the, royal, the royal palace at Knossos had a latrine on the ground floor with a roof, rooftop overhead water reservoir, which basically collected rainwater and was probably the wor world's first flush toilet. Okay, uh, moving north to Greece. Uh, <clears throat> the Greeks were also using pipes uh, uh, at this time to distribute water and remove human waste. Um, the pipes were made of lead and bronze um, and were used by the Greeks primarily to distribute water. Um, <clears throat> most of the drains were underground. <clears throat> and Greece had a system of aqueducts uh, uh, for carrying water around the city. Uh, the sewers in Athens uh, delivered storm water and human waste to a collection basin outside of town. And then from the basin, the storm water waste were conveyed through uh, brick-lined conduits to fields to irrigate uh, and fertilize farmland. Okay, <clears throat> now the Roman Empire. In Rome, water was distributed with lead pipes. Uh, in the first sewer, uh, amazingly, was conducted between 800 and 735 BC. Um, <clears throat> by 180, all homes were required to be connected to the sewer system, which is a pretty amazing uh, societal accomplishment. Um, <clears throat> the Romans built public restrooms, which were known as rooms of easement. Uh, and they were so proud of their bathrooms that Roman officials would sometimes have discussions with visiting dignitaries while sitting on the latrines. Um, most of the bathrooms uh, were co-ed uh, and were not private, as were the public baths. In 510 BC, the, Roman, the Romans completed construction of the Cloaca Maxima, uh, which is Latin for the main drain. Uh, it was made of cut stone. Uh, no cement was involved, and it drained uh, into the Tiber River. Its original purpose was to drain a marsh upon which a large portion of Rome was eventually built. Uh, the sewer has remained in service for over 2,400 years. Okay, <clears throat> with the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, European civilization lost the concept of baths, basic sanitation, aqueducts, and engineered water and sewage systems. Uh, we entered the Dark or the Middle Ages. The Dark Ages were also euphemistically known as the Dung Ages, and for good reason. Basically, sanitation back then was very primitive. Um, <clears throat> during the so-called Dark Ages, uh, soldiers adopted the creed that uncleanliness was next to godliness. And so bathing and sanitation became quite uncommon. Um, homes, towns, and streams were filthy. Uh, additionally, diseases were common. So epidemics decimated towns and villages. Probably a quarter or more of the ancient European population routinely died of disease like cholera and the plague. Um, <clears throat> and larger European cities were just filled with dreadful filth and stench and um, <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> uh, now well-to-do people <clears throat> in the Dark Ages um, <clears throat> had basically uh, these chamber pots that are also called Jordans, uh, and they kept them in small cupboards. Um, and some people had servants called grooms of the stool, and whose job it was to clean and maintain the chamber pot. So it became custom of the men who were walking women down the street in the Middle Ages uh, to walk in the side closest to buildings and protect the women from any falling excrement. If you are fortunate enough to live in a castle in the Middle Ages, uh, your excrement was dumped through the floor into a cesspool below the main floor of the castle. <clears throat> Sometimes the main floor Floors, which were often made of wood, broke through and people fell into the cesspool. Uh, for example, uh, in 1183, the Holy Roman Emperor in Germany held an annual meeting, or a, a diet, in the Palace of Erfurt. Uh, and the floor of the main hall broke and many of the dinner guests fell into the cesspool and drowned, although the Emperor survived. <clears throat> and then... Um, in 1326 in England, Richard the Raker had just been seated for a meal when the wood floor gave way and drowned him in the cesspool. 
Okay, let's now fast forward to the 1700s and focus on the development of the sewer system in London, which has a similar story to that of other large European cities at the time. Um, <clears throat> in London, the 1700s, sewers were basically open ditches um, in pre-existing waterways uh, that drained into the, uh, the Them River. <clears throat> uh, by the early 1700s, nearly every home in London had a cesspool uh, beneath it, uh, and there was just a horrible smell in, in houses, in the streets, uh, that was particularly bad <clears throat> on summer nights. Okay, now in the mid-1800s, uh, Louis Pasteur proved that disease could be caused by germs. So knowledge was building up that sanitation could potentially prevent disease. <clears throat> uh, and there were a number of cholera epidemics that awakened the need uh, for construction of a good sewage system. Um, but the event that really moved the sewer needle forward in London was called the Great Stink of 1858 to 1859. So here's how it happened. Uh, the Thames River um, <clears throat> basically receives waste uh, of thousands of people <clears throat> who lived upstream of Parliament. And many of the sewers, uh, uh, basically tributaries uh, to the Thames River, could only physically drain during low tide. The problem was that low tide, the river didn't have enough flow to carry the waste downstream and out to sea. Um, and then the incoming tide would then push the waste upstream. Um, so this cycle resulted in the river essentially becoming a wide open to sunlight cesspool for the excrement of nearly three million people. And it created such a foul smell in London that Parliament had to shut down during the summer months. Um, worse yet, the, the Thames River was also the source of drinking water for a large portion of London. So people were drinking water contaminated with human excrement. Okay, now the, the Great Stink led to the installation of large new sewers to deliver waste to the Thames River. Um, basically uh, to a discharge point downstream of the Parliament building so that the stench wasn't so bad that it would prevent government from doing its job. Uh, now, Queen Victoria was so excited <clears throat> about the new larger sewers that she ordered a small rail line, basically a railroad, to be installed within the drain to transport people up and down to show off how marvelous it was. Okay. <clears throat> Let's now talk about the Kent sewer problem. Um, compared to the residents of London in the 1850s who endured the Great Stink, our problem was pretty minor, uh, and yet it was significant enough to put our unit out of commission for a couple of days. Um, so on March 31st, the drains backed up at the Kent Dialysis Unit in the middle of the morning dialysis shift. Uh, runs were canceled, patients had to be rescheduled, and the unit was closed the following day, which is April 1st, and that is no joke. Um, <clears throat> we called up Rotor Reader, uh, and this man came and inspected our drain, and he found that our main drainage pipe, which uh, appears to be made of galvanized steel, had corroded in several areas, uh, essentially leaving large holes in the wall of the pipes through which rocks had passed into the drain. So uh, essentially rocks, paper towels, and other hygiene products had plugged up the drain. Okay, <clears throat> now, the main drainage pipe travels through the foyer of our conference room, um, and contractors had to remove the concrete in the room and expose and, and replace the involved section of pipe uh, within the dialysis unit. But fortunately, the pipe extends through the remainder of the building, which is currently occupied by a pharmacy, and at some point will probably have to be replaced as well. Uh, it's convenient that this happened during the COVID pandemic, uh, when we were not offering choices and other educational classes because we wouldn't have been able to do this in the midst of all of these repairs. Um, of note, the landlord is not happy with this, uh, probably legitimately raise some, raise some concerns that the drain problem could have in part been caused by corrosion uh, by the acidic dialysate which passes through the drain. But then again, all of this galvanized pipe you know, eventually rusts and corrodes and that's why these days we use uh, PVC pipe instead. Okay, <clears throat> so the Kent drain problem illustrates a couple of ways that <clears throat> drainage pipes uh, can be compromised, uh, but there are other ways too that uh, sewer uh, pipes, 
uh, through our pipes can be um, obstructed. So <clears throat> uh, basically, uh, sewer pipes can be affected by pipe corrosion and deterioration obstructed by debris, uh, as in our case. Uh, damage from tree roots is also very common. But more interesting than all of these, uh, basically, in large cities, sewers can be obstructed by something called fatbergs. Okay, a fatberg uh, is a compound of the words fat and berg, uh, essentially uh, borrowing from the term uh, iceberg. It was first used in 2008 to describe large rock-like lumps of cooking fat uh, that had washed up on the beaches in Wales. Uh, and by 2010, it was used in reference to sewer blocking fat deposits in the sewers of London. Um, essentially, a fatberg is a giant mass made up of hardened oil, fat, wet wipes, and other waste items. Um, it is a growing problem literally in sewers, and many have been discovered. Uh, so, for example, in August of 2013, a fatberg roughly the size of a bus that weighed 17 tons was discovered in the drains under London. September 2014, Fatberg the size of a Boeing 747 was removed from the drain also in London. April 2015, a 130-foot Fatberg was removed from the sewers of London. July 2015, a 390-foot Fatberg was discovered in Wales. September 2017, 820-foot Fatberg weighing over 140 tons was found under Whitechapel, London, uh, and it was called the Whitechapel Fatberg. It took over two months to remove, working seven days a week, cost over two million pounds to remove, uh, and two large pieces of the Fatberg uh, were suddenly displayed at the Museum of London uh, in 2018. It was one of the most popular exhibits. Um, in September 2017, the Fatberg was discovered under the streets of Baltimore, Maryland, which caused a spillage of 1.2 million U.S. gallons of sewage into Jones Falls. April of 2018, a Fatberg was discovered under South Bank in London. Uh, it was suspected to be larger than the one found under Whitechapel. In February 2019, the largest Fatberg in the U.K. was discovered in a sewer at Birchall Street in Liverpool, weighed 400 tons, and was 250 meters long. December 2019, Fatberg in the north of England was discovered with a weight of three elephants. And finally, in April of 2020, a 42-ton Fatberg was discovered in Melbourne, Australia. Its unusually large size was blamed primarily on the shortage of toilet paper caused by the COVID-19 outbreak, and a lot of people were using wipes, which uh, contribute to the development of Fatbergs. On the positive side, uh, fatbergs can also be harvested as a source of fuel, uh, specifically biogas. So biogas basically is a mi mixture of gases produced by the breakdown of organic matter uh, in the absence of oxygen, um, primarily consisting of methane and carbon dioxide, and can be produced from raw materials such as agricultural waste, manure, municipal waste, plant material, sewage, uh, green waste, food waste, or fatbergs. So most of the fatberg discovered in Whitechapel in London in 2017 was converted into biodiesel. All right, <clears throat> um, in the last part of this talk, I'd like to review physiologic drain problems that we see clinically and affect our dialysis patients on a regular basis. First one is most common, it's atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis is <clears throat> a disease in which the inside of an artery narrows due to the buildup of plaque inside human blood vessels, in other words, our pipes. And <clears throat> like a fatberg, uh, the plaque is made up of fat and cholesterol and calcium and other substances found in the, in the blood. It is the number one cause of death and disability in the developed world, and it's the number one cause of death in dialysis patients. <clears throat> if you develop atherosclerosis of the arteries in your heart, called the coronary arteries, um, <clears throat> it can compromise the delivery of oxygenated blood to the heart muscle, and this can result in chest pain and shortness of breath and other symptoms, and basically can progress to a heart attack and death. So in other words, <clears throat> proper plumbing of our circulatory system is very important to maintaining good health. 
Uh, plumbing is also a very important part of maintaining proper function of the dialysis fistula. Um, a narrowing of <clears throat> a fistula is called a stenosis uh, and can affect problems with drainage or the outflow of blood from the arm. Um, the mechanism of narrowing in the fistula, however, is different than atherosclerosis. In other words, it doesn't occur because of cholesterol and fat accumulation. Instead, um, <clears throat> the formation of stenosis or narrowing is probably initiated by damage to the lining of the blood vessel, so the endothelial cells. And in contrast, <clears throat> or in reply, the smooth muscle uh, of the wall proliferates and you get collagen deposition, which is what these arrows are pointing to, um, <clears throat> and um, essentially smooth muscle proliferation and something called neointimal hyperplasia. Okay, <clears throat> um, drainage uh, is also very important in peritoneal dialysis. Uh, in peritoneal dialysis, catheter outflow problems are very common. In fact, a lot of people switch from peritoneal dialysis to hemodialysis because of drainage problems. Um, essentially, uh, peritoneal dialysis outflow failure can be defined as uh, incomplete recovery of, of whatever dialysate or fluid you put inside of the belly uh, despite 45 minutes of uh, drain time. Um, and there are lots of reasons why uh, drainage problems can occur in the setting of peritoneal dialysis, uh, such as fibrin, um, can plug up the little ports that, that drain the tube. By far the most common cause, however, is constipation. Uh, when the bowel becomes full of stool, essentially it can squash the PD catheter, making it difficult uh, to drain uh, the PD fluid out of the belly. Okay. Um, Hemodialysis catheters involve plumbing as well, because there are pipes, there are tubes. Um, and a catheter uh, occlusion can occur essentially when a blockage uh, <clears throat> prevents either flushing the central line or aspirating blood. This happens all the time. Uh, an occlusion can be thrombotic, that is due to a blood clot, or it can be non-thrombotic, so due to something else. About 40 to 50 percent of all occlusions of catheters are non-thrombotic. Uh, they can result from like catheter malposition or kinking uh, uh, <clears throat> or an undesirable catheter tip location, um, something like that. Um, if a catheter becomes partially occluded or loses blood return, uh, that's when we instill a medication called a fibrinolytic. Uh, which uh, is uh, essentially TPA, that's the only one that is FDA approved uh, by the Food and Drug Administration uh, to treat a thrombotic occlusion. Okay, um, the last example of a drainage problem that I'd like to go through is a medical problem called hydronephrosis. Um, hydronephrosis <clears throat> is swelling of the kidney that occurs secondary to obstruction uh, to the flow of urine. There are a whole bunch of causes. Common one is like a kidney stone. Uh, you can also have <clears throat> a narrowing of the tube called a ureter, uh, which drains the kidney. Uh, <clears throat> men have a prostate gland, which sits at the base of the bladder and swells with age. And if that uh, pinches down on the, <clears throat> on the urethra, it can make it difficult to empty the bladder and that can cause obstruction. Um, <clears throat> the treatment essentially is to remove the obstruction, so remove the stone or treat the prosthetic enlargement, but if it's not treated, uh, you can develop kidney failure, and there are plenty of patients who are on dialysis because of <clears throat> a plumbing problem of their native kidneys and bladder. Okay, it's time of the talk that all of you uh, look forward to so much. It's quiz time. Question one. Uh, the main drain, or cloaca maxima, completed in this ancient civilization is still in use today. You guessed it. Uh, what is the Roman Empire? So <clears throat> this uh, cloaca maxima drain uh, looks better than uh, most modern day architecture. It's this beautiful piece of work cut of hone stone, and uh, as I said, still is... <clears throat> somewhat functional today. What was the great stink? Question two. It 
That's exactly right. So it was that terrible smell in London that occurred in 1858 to 1859 that shut down Parliament and basically uh, <clears throat> accelerated the construction of a new underground uh, sewer system that drained the Thames River. What is a chamber pot? Excellent. A uh, chamber pot <clears throat> is a collection vessel used to collect excrement uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, and if you were poor, you had to empty your own chamber pot. Uh, but if you were wealthy, you had someone to empty the chamber pot for you. Uh, in either case, the waste just got dumped out the window into the street, uh, contributing to the filth and stench of uh, the Middle Ages. Next question, what is the term for a congealed mass of fat, wet wipes, and waste that may clog a city sewer? Excellent, a fat bird. Okay, so thank you all for listening, uh, and thank you for making Kent the greatest dialysis unit in the world. Uh, this is Andy Brokenbro signing out until next month.